deep waters all the way down to 5,000 meters or, or even potentially down to about 6,000 meters of water depth. I'm not going to talk about mining on continental shelves, such as digging up gravel and, uh, and aggregates around uh, the coasts of countries. I'm not talking about diamond mining off Namibia, and I'm not talking about phosphate mining. I'm, I'm really talking about deep sea mining, and, and we'll explain what that is as we go along. So my talks are going to follow this plan. It's an introduction to the minerals first, so we can orientate ourselves. Then we'll take a look at what's driving the demand and uh, getting everyone so excited. Um, I'll briefly comment on how close we are towards mining, and then we'll tackle the environmental issues at, at the end. So firstly, there are three main ores when we talk about deep sea mining. And the most important one is going to be manganese nodules. And these are probably going to be mined first. <clears throat> so manganese nodules are small golf ball potato sized nodules, and they just form by precipitation from seawater around some form of solid object, which could be a shark's tooth, it could be a grain of um, sand or, or other rock. And they sit at the seabed and they form this very thin layer, just a potato or golf ball thickness and, and often discontinuous. Um, they occur in deep water abyssal plains, which are very flat areas of the seabed, um, quite a long way away from land quite often, and in water depths of between 4,000 and 6,500 meters or so. So I'll, I'll show this later, but the highest metal contents are, are generally found in the Pacific Ocean. So these nodules contain a whole range of metals, but the most important ones for deep sea mining and the ones that are likely to be extracted are going to be cobalt, nickel, copper, manganese, and molybdenum. So my talk is really about those sort of metals. Um, just a little aside, because I know some of you already know about this, um, this is a ship called the Glomar Explorer in 1974, and it really fired everybody up about mining deep sea nodules. So in six years before this, a Russian nuclear armed submarine sank in the Pacific about 1,600 miles uh, northwest of the Hawaii Islands. And the Americans were desperate to collect that submarine and find out what it obtained, what it, um, was armed with and, and how, it, how um, the code books worked. But they couldn't do that openly, so they set up a ruse and they got Howard Hughes to front it all up because he was an eccentric rich man. He built this ship, it went off, it pretended to be not mining manganese nodules, but in fact it had a huge trap door in the bottom of the ship through which they could try and lift this submarine. They only got part of it back in the end, but it did fire everybody up at that time about deep sea mining. Just a small aside there. The second major ore is cobalt crusts. These are formed in a similar way to manganese nodules by precipitation from seawater. But here, the precipitate um, adheres to hard rocks, anywhere you find hard rocks in, in the middle of the ocean. And that's usually on seamounts, tops of seamounts on ridges or platforms where you get more currents, which keeps the normal sediment away. And then you can get a buildup of this material. The thickest deposits known are about 26 centimeters. So again, it's a very, very thin deposit. We call it, some of us call it a two-dimensional deposit. Um, and it contains similar wide range of, of metals. Um, of interest are cobalt, nickel, and copper. And, but they may also mine platinum. And in this case, rare earths may also be mined from uh, cobalt crusts. But this is some way behind the mining of manganese nodules and, and the other ores. So it, it, it's unlikely in the, in the near future, at least. You can see down here on the bottom left, a, a picture of some seamounts in there off New Zealand. And, and it would be on places like that where this crust would form. The third type of deposit is called polymetallic sulfides. And you can see here one of these black smoker hydrothermal vents on an ocean ridge. Uh, spewing out very hot fluids that can be up to 400 degrees centigrade. Um, these form at ocean plate boundaries where the plates move apart. And you can see in the bottom right diagram there that this causes water to be dragged into the seabed, the, the blue parts of those arrows, pulled through the crust, 
and heat it up where it is then able to dissolve some metals in the underlying uh, mantle and, and deeper crust. This water is then dragged through and pushed out at the plate boundary as these hydrothermal vents, which in some cases can precipitate uh, metals. The metals here are copper, gold, silver, zinc and lead. So they're quite different from the other two resources. And in fact, this is a very different resource altogether. And, and the way it's formed, it turns into a three-dimensional deposit, very similar to some mines we have on land. Whoops, I need to go back. Um, so if we look at a, a global map of where all of these resources occur, you can see the blue patches on here are uh, nodules, manganese nodules or polymetallic nodules, they're called by both names. Um, and they occur a lot in the Pacific and also in some of the other ocean basins. The cobalt crusts also occur predominantly in the Northwest Pacific up there, but you can see some other deposits dotted around the world. And then these ocean ridges where the tectonic plates spread apart tend to run through the middle of some oceans like the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean and somewhat displaced to the side in the Pacific Ocean. So they're quite widespread globally, but you can see that they are right in the middle of the ocean in, in many cases. So having talked to you about the, the three metals, let's have a quick look at uh, why there's an increasing demand for some of these metals. Uh, you, you probably know the story here. So it's really driven by urbanization and this is the move of rural populations to cities where they require much more in terms of housing, roads, railways, infrastructure, electricity, et cetera, services. And all of these have a higher demand on, on metals. But in addition to that, we're also trying to transition to an alternative en energy society. And you can see on here a pretty picture of a, a solar energy plant in, in the deserts of Nevada. This one produces 150 megawatts and covers uh, nearly six and a half square kilometers. But there are other much bigger ones, as, such as the Pahandla Solar Park in India, which when it's completed will produce 2.2 gigawatts of electricity. And these solar plants themselves have a high demand on a number of, of metals. So I put at the bottom here that it's expected um, that the global installation of wind power by 2028, which is only a few years off, is going to require another 5.5 million tons of copper to be produced. So let's have a look at some of these elements which we find in the deep sea minerals and what their demand is. So here you can see the projected demand for copper. At, uh, in 2020, 2020, we produced 25 million tons of uh, copper globally. But you can see that that's projected to climb very high so that by 2050, it's going to be up to about 60 million tons and by 2100 could even reach 90 million tons. Obviously the predictions get more vague with, with time. And a lot of this, the blue line in there is driven by the infrastructure and the uh, electricity generation that I um, talked about in the previous slide. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about these later, but I'll just put the numbers up because they're sometimes used by mining companies to say that you know, there's not a lot of um, reserves left of these um, metals. So the estimated reserve at the moment is about 870 million tons. But if we get up to using 80 million tons a year, that's only a small number of years worth of metal. So people have talked about substitution, by which they mean, can you replace one metal with another one? And if you look at some of the um, texts on, on uh, use of copper, you'll see that they're already looking into substituting aluminium for copper in some um, cables, electricity cables. People also talk about recycling, which is obviously uh, very important and, and must happen in a much better way than it does at the moment. But you can't recycle enough material to fill the rising demand, even if you recycled everything. And a lot of the material in um, existence at the moment is already to, you know, um, keyed into existing things which are still working. So you can only recycle something when it comes to the end of its life. So there's nowhere near enough to power up an increase in demand. So nickel and cobalt were two of the elements I told you um, were important from deep sea mining and they are fundamental to many batteries. And so here we look at the 
projected demand for energy storage, in other words, in batteries to meet different climate scenarios. So if you look at the, um, the orange one on here, the paler orange one on here, this is all for car batteries. And up here in, above the orange, the, the darker orange, this is for grid storage. So if you produce excess wind power, you could store that in a, in a battery, for example, going forward. Um, Bill Gidley, who's on the call here, um, gave a very good talk about cars and, and uh, energy storage uh, a month ago. Now you can see on here three climate scenarios. There's the disastrous 2.7 degree temp rise at the bottom here, which will require, just to get to that level, will require quite a, an increase in, in battery driven cars. There's the two degree rise scenario by 2100, which will require a greater move to electric cars. And then there's a, the best scenario of less than two degree temperature rise, which will require an even greater use of electric cars. So here's a, a graph showing the projected increase in electric vehicles. Um, at the moment, there's about 1.5 billion vehicles on the road in the world. And about a third of that will be electric cars predicted by 2040. So this is going to require a huge amount of batteries and requirement for batteries is probably going to re require a large amount of cobalt and nickel. So what about that demand for cobalt? Uh, it, unfortunately, the papers I've been reading all have different timescales on them. So the timescales on these graphs are somewhat different. So now we, we, we can only predict on the graph at least to 2030. Um, but you see here in the bottom row, this is the non-battery industrial use of cobalt. It's, it's used as in metal alloys and it's pretty constant through time, no big increase. And, and then you see portable battery devices such as those using your computers and phones and, and everything else, which is portable. That's going to increase a little bit. And then you get this huge increase in demand for um, passenger cars on here. And there are papers predicting that this is going to go up to about 640 tons per annum by 2050. Whereas at the moment, we're just producing just over 100 tons per annum of cobalt. The current known reserves of cobalt are estimated at 7.1 million tons. So, you know, there's, there's, um, you, you can, if you were a miner and you wanted to go to the deep sea, you could say, we're going to run out of this, we've got to go to the deep sea and we've got to get there urgently. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I should have just mentioned on here that the line, the black line on here is the uh, DART and other big suppliers of cobalt globally after it's been mined and processed. And they, um, they, they're predicting this crisis in about 2025 when um, the known rate at which we're producing cobalt is going to start to level off and uh, needs to be filled by um, some new mines coming on stream, potentially those in the deep sea. So here, this is just that the previous slides were all for uh, globally. This is one based on the European Union, and this is nickel demand in batteries largely for cars. Again, down here, the, the dark blue on this graph is automotive electric cars, and then all of the others are, are fairly negligible. But you'll see the increase in demand is, is absolutely enormous. From less than 100,000 um, tons at the moment, we're going to be going up to two and a half million tons a year requirement just within Europe for nickel. And of course, there's other places, there's um, Asia, there's North America. And uh, so nickel demand globally is, is going to go really high in the future. But the largest car producer in China, BYD, has just um, decided it's not going for a um, a lithium ion battery, it's going for a lithium ion phosphate battery, which doesn't use nickel or cobalt. So there's clearly a choice here going forward. Um, and it, I, I don't know what the new factory that's just been announced uh, for the north of England is going to produce, but if it was producing lithium ion phosphate, there would be much less requirement to go to the deep sea, for example. But I guess it's going to be um, the, um, the, the batteries that require nickel and cobalt. So Countries are also worried about security of supply. And if one country holds a monopoly of supply, then other countries can be held to ransom. Uh, and this happened um, in 2006, I think it was, when China withheld its supply of rare earths to Japan in, in uh, response to some other dispute they had. 
And they were the main producer at the time, and this really had serious repercussions in Japan and, until it was resolved. Um, so you can see that a lot of the cobalt in the world is, is, comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is not the most stable country in the world, and that molybdenum is largely, or nearly half of it, is, is located in, in China. Some of the other metals that we're talking about, nickel and copper, are much more widely distributed. So there seems to be a case for deep sea mining um, because we require all of this um, metal in the future. And the CEO of the metals company, a new, new company which has just been formed out of a previous company called Deep Green, um, makes this statement. Clean energy is not possible without taking billions of tons of metal from the planet. I'm not sure it's going to be billions, but C4 nodules offer a way to reduce the environmental bill of this extraction. And we're getting into this industry with a deep commitment to ocean health. So you can see in here, he's making a lot of statements about environmental credentials, and we're going to be doing it in a, in a good way. And um, that's because they're worried about those aspects of, of what they're trying to do. Um, so I, I need to tell you a little bit more because the, the um, mining companies often say we're running out of reserves on land. So we used to get mines that had 7% copper and now they're down to 2% copper. So clearly the resources are diminishing on land and we're going to have to go to the deep sea. But it's not entirely true. And so if you bear with me, I'll try and explain this diagram. So this is a what I call a hypothetical ore body. So it, it's a deposit of ore sitting in the ground and in the middle, it's got very high grade of, of say copper or whatever metal it is. But surrounding it might be lower grade copper, it might be very low grade on the outside and then medium grade in the middle in here. So, and it, it won't be square, obviously it'll be you know, some obscure shape in the ground. So if your technology is not very good or if the price isn't very high, you would probably just mine that high grade ore and you'd produce a big pile of waste rock and tailings and the metal that you were looking for. And so this is driven by the technology. Maybe you can't extract enough metal out of the low grade rock, and, or maybe the cost of extracting it is just too high to, to um, make it economic. But let's say you improve the technology or the price of that metal goes right through the roof then what you would do is you would go in and mine all those lower grades as well as the high grade. And not only that, but you could also mine the waste rock and tailings, which have probably still got one or two percent of whatever metal you're looking for in them. So because we have a bigger demand for these metals, with time, we're not cherry picking just the high grade deposits. We're mining high grade deposits and lower grade deposits because it's economically feasible and profitable to do. So the average grade that's mined is automatically going to go down, irrespective of whether we find more high grade deposits or not. Uh, and this is one of the myths driven by the, the mining companies who say oh, the grades are going down with time and it looks as if we're sort of running out, but it, it's probably not true because we're still finding high grade deposits around the world. So the grade is probably not reducing that much. So how much metal is there in, in deep sea? So here I'm just going to talk about clarion Clipperton zone, which I should have pointed out on that map earlier, but it's in the, the central Pacific um, west of, of Mexico, and it's the big area of manganese nodules. So if you look at the, and it's easy to work out what metals are in that area because it's covered with nodules, you can work out the total area, the density of nodules, take off the areas of hills, etc and come up with some very good estimates. And the estimate is it's got 21 billion dry tons of nodules. So you can see here that amounts to a huge amount of manganese, but we don't use that much manganese and we have loads of it on land anyway. So these two figures I, I will explain to you. Um, on the right hand side, the reserve base is what mining companies have already assessed as being mineable. So some of that will be proven and they'll be working to mine it today and some of it will be probable which is in the in the bank ready to be mined you know in, in a few years time. The resource which is the middle column on here is what they also know about 
but haven't proven what percentage of metal it's got. Th th these are well-known terms in the mining industry. So it has a prospect to become mineable in the future when the price goes up or they work out exactly how much metal is in there. So it's, it's in the bank, but it's not um, quite available yet. And then in addition to that, of course, there's all that ore which we haven't found yet, and we have no clue how much of that there will be, but ore is still getting um, located and found all over the world at the moment. So we can only compare really to the published numbers which show the resource, which is that which is sort of proven and which is in the bank uh, as possible. Um, so we don't need any more manganese, so nobody would go to the deep sea to mine for manganese. You see the copper on here is also a very small number compared to the terrestrial base. So we wouldn't go to the deep sea to mine for copper. And that's why nickel, cobalt and molybdenum are, are probably the more important metals to look at. And, th and that's why I told you about batteries particularly earlier on. But you can see that nickel has got about similar um, percentage in just the clarion clipperton zone. There are other areas of the deep sea with nodules that could be mined later. And of course, there will be other areas on land where, where more nickel is found in the future. But cobalt is actually has, there's more cobalt in the deep sea than there is on land. And, and if we use that at a high rate, then we might be forced to go to the deep sea to mine for cobalt. And molybdenum is, is um, a little bit more on land than in the deep sea. Um, and just to make another point, um, that different places of the world have different percentages of metals. So the highest percentage of cobalt is in the Cook Islands, and this is the territorial waters of the Cook Islands. But if you went there, you would have a very low percentage of nickel. So given that to make it economic, you've got to mine nickel and cobalt and copper and molybdenum and manganese, um, you want to choose a place where you've got as many of those in, in the high proportions as possible. Although it does depend on the price of each and whether one goes up relative to the other. But you can see these are relatively small percentages, about 1% of, of a lot of these metals, which, which is similar to the percents that are being mined on land, in fact. So coming back to this map again, where are we actually mining? Well, on here you can see in the middle of the Pacific, the clarion Clipperton zone, which I mentioned earlier. That has uh, licenses for, for nodule mining. And there are other nodule mining areas that, denoted by the dashes on here in the Indian Ocean. One license in the Western Pacific there, a little bit of licensing going on by the Cook Islanders. If we add in the places, the, the yellow, red dots where the um, polymetallic sulfides are, are, are going to be mined, we can see concentrations in the Indian Ocean and the North Atlantic Ocean. And then if we add in a couple of areas where cobalt crusts are, uh, looking, being looked at favorably. We've got the Northwest Pacific and we've got an area of Brazil called the Rio Grande Rise. So there's quite a lot of um, potential in the deep sea as we can see here. So the International Seabed Authority, a, a body related to the United Nations uh, established in Jamaica is responsible for managing deep sea mining and promoting deep sea mining and also looking after the environment. So they have a dual function, which is in some ways um, the two halves in opposition to each other. And these are the contracts which they've allowed already. So we can see in the uh, North Atlantic here, we've got three contracts, Poland, France, and Russia have those contracts. Um, other contracts for sulfides in the Indian Ocean, again, Germany, Korea, India, China. And then a whole host of contracts, 17 in total, in this clarion Clipperton zone area. And then a few dotted around uh, looking at um, cobalt crusts. So the clarion Clipperton zone is the key area at the moment. And to mine for manganese nodules, it, it's not so far off as you might think. Um, for some years now, companies have been developing the technology and I show here four nodule mining vehicles. There are many more under development. The technology is not too complicated. It's just an adaption of a dredging uh, vehicle. Um, although the pipe coming up from 4,000 meters to the, to the ship is going to be longer, about twice as long as anything in the oil industry at the moment. 
Um, you can see on the bottom right, uh, it's uh, scaled against the person here, but the final mining machine, I think, will be 16 meters across. So there'll be sizable beasts. And these three machines have all been developed for mining polymetallic sulfides. They were developed um, by a company called SMD uh, up in Newcastle on Tyne for Nautilus Minerals. Nautilus Minerals has since gone bankrupt, but the machines, they're, they're full scale versions this time. They already exist. So you have on the right hand side, um, the auxiliary cutter, which will flatten the seabed into benches. In the middle there, you have the rotary cutter, which will strip mine back and two across the benches. And on the left hand side, you have the collector, which will then go and collect up the swaths of, um, of ore from the seabed. So the technology was, again, adaption of other um, mining equipment. So a quick recap on where we are now. Um, there's uh, an undeniable increasing demand for metals, and that's driven, as we know, by population growth, urbanization, alternative energy demands. The main ores in the deep sea are nodules, crusts, and sulfides, which lie in the middle of the ocean and are under the jurisdiction of the International Seabed Authority. And already the International Seabed Authority has agreed 31 contracts for exploration, 17 of which are in the clarion clipperton zone. And at the moment, it's working on its um, regulations to control mining. So exploration and mining are slightly different. It hasn't given any mining contracts yet, but the contractors are each paying half a million dollars a year to explore uh, with 15 year licenses. But, and this is the second part of my talk, is it going to be an environmental disaster? So you will have heard, I'm sure, in the news about David Attenborough calling for a ban on deep sea mining, WWF have said no to deep sea mining, and all these companies at the bottom have said they don't want to use metals from the deep sea, at least at the moment. So we better look at what these problems are. So they're very dependent on the type of ore and somewhat different for each of the three types. Um, just a picture to show you the difference between dense nodules from the Cook Islands and much less dense nodules from the uh, clarion Clipperton zone. The left-hand ones could be mined, the right-hand ones are not economic in this case. But nodules live or are found rather in, in very peculiar environments. They're, they're on these deep abyssal plains, large areas of flat C4 composed of very soft mud where you get a very, very slow ray down of material from above. And it can be as low as one millimeter per thousand years. So almost nothing being added to the seabed. And the nodules can stay on the surface almost forever. And they're millions of years old and they sit just on the top of that mud. So you would normally expect them to get buried, but nobody knows how they stay on the surface. But probably with such a low sedimentation rate, if one animal turns them over every hundred years or even a thousand years, then that's probably enough just to keep them permanently at the surface. You find almost none below the surface. Um, these are very stable environments. And the, the other odd thing about them is they're very, very poorly studied. They're often a long way from um, oceanography centers or scientific institutions. Scientists haven't bothered to go there very much in the past until recently when there's now a clamor to go there and find out as much as possible. Um, so they do have animals living there. Um, they live on the mud, in the mud, and some swim just above the mud. But many of them are dependent on the nodules. They either anchor to the nodules, it's the only hard substrate around, or they live in cracks and crevices on the surface of those nodules. And, and what the biologists find when they go there, there are many, many, many species. It's just teeming with different species, not, not very many specimens, but very high numbers of species. And every sample that's taken contains new species, which are not yet being described. And quite often, it, it's very difficult to find that species again. So you're much more likely to find new species than examples of the same species. So they appear to be rare, but maybe they're not rare. It could just be due to the very small number of samples of it that have been taken in, in these areas. And I, I mentioned that a lot of them are, are dependent on the nodules. So a, a, lot, a, a large number of animals living on, on the, attached to the nodules are sponges, which live on 
elevated stalks, which puts them above the seabed where they get a slightly higher current velocity and they're more likely to find food. But when that sponge dies, often other animals come along and, and take over and use the stalk because it doesn't tend to decay very quickly. So on the left hand here, you can see an octopus which is using the stalk and it's laid about 30 eggs which are attached to the stalk. The, the octopus folds itself around them to give some protection and they can take a, a year or even longer before they hatch, uh, in which time the, the, the parent octopus falls off and dies and the, and the young ones uh, hatch. On the right hand side, you can see a different organism, an anemone attached to the top of the sponge stalk where it's up in a, in a higher um, food zone. Of course, when you've mined all the nodules away, the sponges can't live because they can't attach to a nodule anymore. And these animals, which depend on the sponge stalks, can't survive any longer either. So, and, and it will take millions of years for those nodules to come back in these areas. So apart from the impact on some animals like that, it, it, really um, individual animals in, in small areas, what the conservationists are really concerned about is the large area of deep sea mining. And I mentioned the contracts that were let out earlier. So they're the colors on here, but the total area of contract blocks is 1.25 million square kilometers. You can see them better on this slide. So it, it's all the bright colors on here apart from the yellow. The yellow are reserved areas which are reserved for the developing world to um, uh, reserve for themselves for mining. But the developing world was defined uh, many years ago by the UN and so countries like China and Singapore are both listed as developing countries, so they can apply for these, these particular areas. Um, so each block is up to 75,000 square kilometers in size, and the total area under contract, as I said, is 1.25 million square kilometers. That's about twice the area of France. Now, not all of that is going to be mined because there's hills and there's areas without nodules in there. Um, but maybe 20 to 30% of that area is going to be of high concentration of nodules and, and could be mined in the future. So that gives a vast area of, of, um, of mining impacts. Um, and you can see here on this slide the difference between deep sea mining and land-based mining. And this is really what gets the environmentalists quite upset. I put on here the Murrin Murrin mine. This, this, this image, this brown image, is a, is a Google Earth image of central Western Australia. And you can see on here one of the big nickel cobalt mines, the Murrin Murrin mine. It occupies an area of 70 square kilometers, but it has a deposit that contains nickel at about the same percentage as in the deep sea, and it contains about half the percentage of cobalt, but it doesn't contain the molybdenum and the copper. But here, the, the layer is 20, 20 meters thick, as opposed to that few centimeters in the deep sea. So to get the same amount of nickel, you would need an area the size of that yellow square. You'd need a 17,000 square kilometers. So now you can see why 75,000 square kilometers was allowed, because that's, um, that will mean that 75,000 square kilometers, if you, if you mine 20 or 30%, you would have about the same nickel as you find on a, on a land mine. Um, a mine or land. And the, the rate of recovery in the deep sea is probably going to be about two and a half million tons of nodules per year. So that will destroy about 180 square kilometers of seafloor each year for each operator. So let's see how nodule mining is going to happen. Here we see a cartoon showing one of these um, vehicles, uh, a cartoon of the vehicle under development. So at the front of the vehicle, jets of water blast the seabed, freeing the nodules from that soft mud. The whole mixture, nodules and soft mud and water, is then taken into the vehicle. The nodules and some of the water is sent up the pipe to the ship. And the waste products, the water, the sediment, is dumped out behind the machine. So some of that waste material will form as a slurry on the seabed which will mean that the seabed has a completely different composition to what it had before, which will make it inappropriate for many um, seabed living animals. And it will also generate this plume behind the vehicle. 
but but it's it, it's not just the destruction of this area. This is a picture that was taken 26 years after a, 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 a scientist made a disturbance event, event on the seabed. So they, they went into this area and they dragged things along the seabed, got rid of the nodules and left it sort of barren. 26 years later, they went back and this photograph was taken and samples were taken. And it was found that relatively few of the organisms had come back to live in this disturbed area. And because we know these animals are slow to reproduce and, and very long lived, that it, it's predicted that it's going to take hundreds or even thousands of years before those mud living animals come back to these areas. And those animals which live on the nodules, it will take millions of years for them to come back. So we're not only going to generate large areas which are impacted, but the impact is going to be very long lived. And there's an addition problem, which is the plumes that I mentioned before. So you'll see here when the mining vehicle goes along, it, it pumps the nodules with the yellow arrows up the pipe to the ship in a slurry of, uh, containing water, but they have to be stored dry on the ship. So that water has to be removed and put back into the ocean. And when it comes back into the ocean, it makes what's called a plume. So we've got two plumes now, one from the back of the vehicle and one from the returned water. And both of these are going to be heavily charged with particles and put into environments which are totally pristine with very, very, very few particles. And so the organisms will not be able to cope with those plumes. So if the plume lands on the area that's already mined, it won't make any difference, of course, but, but this can extend the area of impact beyond the area that's mined by some kilometers. Originally, it was thought it could be up to 100 kilometers, but the more recent research has shown it can be some tens of kilometers at least be beyond the area mined, making it a really large area of impact. So this, uh, if it works, shows you a plume being developed. This is a, a vehicle which happened to have a camera on it which just accidentally glanced the seabed in the clarion clipperton zone and it generated this great cloud of uh, sediment suspended in water. It's like a dust cloud on land, but, but here it's really fine particles. And these take an awful long time to sink again and can be carried away in currents um, in the meantime. So that's a, that's a typical plume. In, in areas of sulfide mining, these, tombs, these um, plumes can also be toxic because there's a lot of sulfides produced in those areas, but probably they won't be toxic in areas of nodule and crust mining, but at least the particles will have a, a, a very large impact in all the areas. So the metals company that I mentioned earlier have suggested you could put the whole thing in some sort of hood and, and prevent any of this. I mean, they're, they're looking for good news stories, basically. But anyway, if you saw that previous picture, you only have to touch the seabed to generate these clouds. So it, it's not going to work. And even if you generated that great cloud within the hood, then you've got to take it up the pipe, in which case you've still got to put it back through the return pipe into the water column where it, it might have even more impact than on the seabed. So this is not an answer to, uh, to getting rid of plumes. So just briefly to tell you about mining cobalt crusts, um, you can see here uh, a picture of uh, some of the organisms that live on crusts. You get sponges, corals, other uh, animals that are attached to the seabed. And some of these corals can live for really long periods of time, up to a thousand years in some cases, or, or potentially even more. So it, it can be a very diverse ecosystem with many species, again, not well studied. It's probably stable with very slow growing organisms, which because of that are slow to reproduce. And so recovery again is going to be very difficult for these crust areas. And again, the large scale of mining is going to be important. So you can see here that each year of mining 2 million tons, and that's a minimum for an economic um, mine site, it is going to destroy somewhere between 20 and 70 square kilometers of, of these seamounts and seamount tops. Um, and then you'll get plumes and they'll either go down slope and affect the seabed organisms or they'll go off into the water column or, or, or potentially do both and uh, affect organisms in those areas. So sulfide mining, um, the third one, so I told you before that sulfide mining was very different to the other two. 
it's very much like this, but underwater. It's a pit in the ground. It'll be a hole in the, in the seabed. Um, so I showed you previously a, a Google map with all the um, um, Clarion Clipperton zone contract blocks on it. There are two mine sites here, here at each 10 square kilometers and 10 square kilometers would be a big mine for sulfides. Some of them are only going to be less than a square kilometer. But of course you can't see them because they're too small. But if I put a halo around them of say a 20 kilometer impact area from a plume, then you can finally see them. So they're going to be really small, but of course, if there are many, many of them, then the total impact could be quite large. Just to give you a little bit more geology, I've only got a few more slides, by the way, if anyone's uh, thinking time's running out. Um, this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It comes down through the middle. So you see Greenland at the top, uh, South America, bottom left, Africa, bottom right on here, and Newfoundland on, on the left-hand side. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge comes down through the middle of that as, as a, a ridge going through. And if you look at it in detail with the plates moving apart, the hydrothermal plumes would be in that blue line or quite close to that blue area rather, in, in the middle within a few kilometers either side of the ridge axis. And they will be pumping out their hot fluids uh, all the time. But as you move away from that and they get older, they tend to become intermittent and may become extinct. At some point, they become extinct as they move away from the ridge axis. And, but as they move further and further away from the ridge axis, the sediment begins to build up on top of them and to bury them. So somewhere maybe 10, 20, 30 kilometers from the ridge axis, you might still be able to find them because they won't be buried in sediment and they won't be active. So they may be easier to mine because they're not too hot. If you were to mine an active vent, then this would, might be what it looks like. This is a, a video, a, a hydrothermal vent. Uh, I don't actually know the temperature of this black smoker coming out here, but they're usually a, a few hundred degrees centigrade. The animals can't live in those temperatures. They, they can only live up to uh, 40, 40 odd degrees or so but they get as close as they can because this is where all the bacteria feed on the um, chemicals which are coming out of these black smokers and you have this unique ecosystem. This type of ecosystem, these black smokers only occupy probably 50 square kilometers of the whole planet. And even there, individual species don't live in all um, active vent sites. They only live in small, um, uh, smaller numbers. And so the, the distribution of each of these um, species is, is quite small. But you see there's lots of animals this time, but not so many species, but they are unique animals. Um, so when those black smokers die off or, or go intermittent, then they tend not to have any fauna because they're dependent on the bacteria which live on the fluids which are coming out. So if you could find a pile of vents like this, then there's no animals to worry about. and, it, and mining would not be a major problem. When they, that crust gets a little bit older, it does tend to develop coral gardens, sponge patches, etc. And you, you could then have problems mining because you might impact some of these. And some of these corals can live for hundreds of years or even thousands of years. So, but you can manage these areas because they're very much, they're, they're small and they're like any mining offshore. You have to work out what's there, you have to avoid what's important to avoid and unmine the rest. So if those rules and regulations are put in place, there shouldn't be the, the problems that you have with mining sulfides and, and crusts. So to conclude, deep sea mining is firmly on the horizon and it's driven by increasing demands for metals. We're already a long way down the road and technology is being developed. And in today's Guardian, you will have seen an article that one company is told the International Seabed Authority that it's actually going to go mining within two years. So it's right on the horizon, but this environmental price to pay is still lurking there. And I hope you uh, maybe now understand uh, the issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.